Hi, my name is Eric Foley. I'm the director of the Center for the Business of Sustainability at the Smeal College of Business at Penn State University. Uh, we are hearing quite a lot and reading about a issue of uh, phosphorus pollution, an environmental issue that in, uh, in our view is not talked about enough. Uh, most recently, the news from Piney Point in Florida uh, of uh, nutrient rich water uh, getting poured into um, the Tampa Bay uh, has alarmed uh, a lot of people around an issue that, uh, as I said, doesn't own a lot of mind share. A lot of people were thinking about climate change, business people thinking perhaps about uh, plastics in the oceans and those kinds of things, but phosphorus and nitrogen pollution in particular uh, are uh, also important uh, issues. So I'm excited to spend some time this morning with uh, Hunter Swisher, a Penn State grad, who's a, the CEO of uh, Phospholutions to talk uh, about uh, phosphorus uh, pollution and nutrient pollution in our waterways. So thanks for being here, Hunter. Hey, pleasure to be here, Eric. Thanks for taking the time. Um, yes, so I was exposed to this problem uh, actually at Penn State as an undergrad. I was a plant science major in the College of Ag, uh, studied underneath a professor that developed the technology that I've, I'm now in the process of commercializing. Um, but we learned about this problem actually sitting in, uh, in our Fertilizer 101 class and, and something that I thought was pretty interesting and uh, really, really devoted my, my uh, career to trying to go out and develop solutions uh, for doing so. Wonderful. Uh, well, I look forward to uh, exploring the issue. I think what, what we'll do today is, is, is kind of start big picture in terms of understanding what, what the issue is and, and where phosphate even comes from and what it's used for. Uh, and, um, and get into maybe what some of the solutions are, and in particular, what Phospholutions is bringing, uh, bringing to the marketplace. As we said, as we were getting ready for this, a uh, put, uh, profitable solution, right? True triple bottom line solution to a global problem. So let me maybe set it up a little bit, Hunter. And, and I, I was looking at some headlines and, and gathered some things that I thought this for our, uh, our, our viewers might be interesting as a way to sort of set this up. So just looking at, just looking at Piney Point, um, before it started leaking, the phosphate pond down there had uh, 480 millions of nutrient-laden water. And maybe you can explain what that means in a moment, nutrient-laden. I know that has a lot of significance for, uh, for the ag um, industry. Um, 480 million uh, uh, gallons. And so an environmental scientist that I heard uh, interviewed um, said that, first of all, it's not radioactive. That's kind of a little urban myth that's out there, right? But that if that was to be released over the next one to two weeks, which is the which is the plan, that would be equal to the total releases in a year. I found that quite shocking, and so we'll get into this. And we, of course, we know the issue is uh, algae blooms um, uh, and the stealing of oxygen from the water, in particular in the Tampa Bay. The uh, importance of uh, seagrass to a healthy ecosystem there and crowding out seagrass and so forth. Um, but as we were saying before we started recording, it's not just about Tampa Bay. Uh, this is a global issue. A lot of people don't know that 70% of fresh water globally has a phosphorus problem every year. I found that incredible. 90% uh, uh, of applied phosphorus is lost from our agricultural fields. Incredible. Um, and estimates are that we will run out of phosphorus in, uh, in the future, right? Somewhere between 50 uh, and 100 years. And I also should say too that you know we're in the Chesapeake Bay watershed uh, here at Penn State University, uh, and the estimates there are that 15 million pounds of phosphorus make, makes it to the bay annually. So uh, glad that you're here to help us understand what is the phosphorus issue. We don't hear very much about it. Um, so can you just maybe start there? Is what is phosphorus? Uh, how is it made? How is it applied? How is it used? Help us kind of understand what's going on in Florida by putting into a broader context would be would be a great place to start. Sure. So so phosphorus, generally speaking, uh, it's an element. It's something that uh, exists naturally. Um, it's uh, for us it, why it's important is the second largest nutrient needed for food production. So typically phosphorus is being mined uh, from just a few key locations around the world. Um, phosphorus essentially has built up from old uh, really ancient aquatic sea life um, in certain dense areas across the world. It's been settled and essentially we mine it in the form of rock. Uh, as we mine that rock, we extract the phosphorus and 90% or more of what we pull out of the mine is essentially gonna be converted to phosphatic fertilizers. Hmm. Those phosphate fertilizers are applied all around the world uh, to all of our agronomic soils. 
to essentially uh, provide the nutrients that the crops are taking out of the field each year as we harvest. The problem with, um, with phosphorus in general is that uh, first it's a finite resource. So unlike some other nutrients that we apply for crop production, uh, phosphorus is pulled out of the earth and it's pulled out of the earth out of these finite reserves similar to oil. Um, we can't really run out of this stuff and we gotta do a lot better job at using it more efficiently. Hmm. Um, so the second part of the problem is, is that we're pulling it out at a pretty alarming rate, but we're not using it very well. Um, so it's estimated 60 to 90% of the fertilizer that's applied to the farm field will wash away and never be taken up by the plant. Hmm. And even once it makes it into the plant, the rest of the food chain still absorbs that phosphorus uh, along the way before it arrives onto your dinner plate. Uh, even which when you eat that dinner plate, uh, you still have inefficiencies in your digestive tract and there is phosphorus that's ultimately discharged all of which along that life cycle from mine to fork, 90% or more of phosphorus is estimated to be lost. And ultimately all of it ends up in the, the bottom of the ocean. Mm. Um, so it, at each point throughout that life cycle where it's discharged, uh, it's ultimately gonna make its way into the environment. As you were mentioning before, the big problem is, is that it's a limited nutrients in aquatic ecosystems for certain things like algae and other cyanobacteria to take hold. Um, so when that, when there's abundance of phosphorus, now all of a sudden the plant has everything it needs to take hold and you get these massive outbreaks, um, down in Florida, typically they're called red tide or green tide that comes in, but it's these, these, um, essentially aquatic plants, uh, and other bacteria that, that grow off that phosphorus, emit toxins, uh, they utilize and deplete the oxygen within the water, uh, in the process. They break down, um, they kill coral reefs, like you mentioned, the seagrass, everything gets essentially strangled in the water from no oxygen. Um, and then even one step further, as that phosphor, as that, um, that aquatic growth starts to break down, it's a massive emitter of, of greenhouse gases. There's uh, studies that we've seen that show that phosphorus pollution uh, in the water and that eutrophication effect um, is actually the second largest natural polluter of greenhouse gas emissions worldwide. Wow, wow. This is a pretty incredibly large problem. Uh, our freshwater being, you know, 1% of our Earth's water, 70% mm. uh, of it experiencing phosphorus pollution is, is, is pretty alarming. Um, also due to the fact that we're running out and, you know, estimates show it's, it's quite varied, but, you know, 50 to 100 years is kind of that big alarming number. Mm. Um, when we run out of phosphorus uh, with a growing population and food demand, uh, that's a huge food security risk. Mm. Also due to the fact that these resources are, are so heavily concentrated in just a handful of countries. Um, it represents a global food security risk, uh, no matter where you are in the world. Mm -hmm. Great, great. I I'm curious, why is it that so much of it is lost? I mean, may maybe just within the, you, you mentioned kind of the total value chain, but just within maybe the uh, the gate to gate use that, that w on the farm itself, why is so much phosphorus so easily lost. Yeah, so you have to understand um, really how phosphorus interacts. So, so, so phosphate is an extremely small ion. Um, it is uh, extremely charged, so it's very heavily reactive. And mm -hmm. so when we apply uh, phosphorus fertilizer, typically it's an inorganic or what really what that means is a, a mineral or, or, or chemical-based form. Um, essentially, when we apply phosphorus to the field, we know that there is a good portion of that phosphate that's going to be tied up almost immediately in the soil. Hmm. And in the soil, phosphorus can either be tied up by a microbe, uh, you know, so the, the, the organisms within that soil actually utilize it. Um, you can have it tied up within organic matter in the soil. It can be fixed onto certain soil clays and particles. Uh, and essentially, all of that leads to uh, a good portion of that phosphorus never even being directly available to the plant. And so when you apply phosphorus to the field, it's either going to get tied up in that way, which is, is much more common with phosphorus than, say, other nutrients like nitrogen that move a lot easier through the soil. Um, or you can lose phosphorus due to leaching. So that means it just simply flushes through the soil right into our water. Um, or it can be run off the field through erosion and taken right into our streams and rivers and then ultimately taken downstream. Hmm. So take me onto the field of, the, uh, of, of a farmer. Um, well, I know a lot of, you know, uh, of course, a lot of our agricultural uh, lands are not, you know, the single farmer, they're quite large, uh, you know, sort of industrial operations. Uh, give us a sense of what is it like uh, for the, the from looking at this problem from the perspective of, of the farmer. Uh, so 
when they understand the use of phosphorus as a needed nutrient for their crops, obviously they're trying to earn a profit. Um, do they have a sense of the opportunity here? Do they have a sense of the problem? I mean, what, what's, what's you, you, you have a sort of a scientific understanding of what's really going on. I'm curious to look at it from the other perspective, the, from the farmer side. How do you think they conceive of phosphorus, this problem, the impact on their, you know, profitability? Yeah, so, so first off, I will say that, that farmers are, are naturally stewards of the environment. Mm. You know, farming is a practice where you're close to nature, right? It's, it's just natural in the position. Mm -hmm. I think that we also have to be conscious that these farmers um, are also business folks and they're mm -hmm. operating a business and they're operating a business within the confounds of regulation within um, things that are within the means that they can, they can capture. They're, they're dealing with the budget um, and they're dealing with an expected outcome. And so when you think about a farmer deciding fertility uh, practices, deciding what fertilizers they're gonna use and how much, it really comes down to nickel and diming everything. And, mm. and that's, that's not the farmer's fault for that. It's, it's, it's mm. tough business to be in, mm -hmm. uh, growing these, these commodity crops. And so on any given year, there's an expected outcome for um, the cost per bushel of corn or soybean or any of these crops. And so a farmer is working backwards with their local agronomist to decide what type of fertilizer am I gonna use based on my soil conditions, which typically we take a soil test and that soil test shows that we need X amount of, of pounds of phosphorus to be applied mm -hmm. to meet the, the demand of the crop to optimize yield outcomes. Mm -hmm. And so a farmer, their pain point is that phosphorus is relatively expensive and it's only getting more and more expensive. Um, and we do think that the farmer has a pretty clear understanding of what phosphorus contributes uh, to, to the environmental issue. But I do think that farmers are, are, are not trying to overapply phosphorus uh, just to overapply it. Mm -hmm. It's something that's typically being done because the fertilizer sources that we're using aren't necessarily perfect. Um, these commodity sources are cheap for a reason. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the farmer themselves is trying to get by with as little as possible to maximize my profit. And they are conscious of the issue, but it's very difficult to want to take out your wallet and, and, and pay for enhanced efficiency technology that may double your cost of phosphate. Um, when you don't have a regulatory pressure saying you have to. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Are there particular either crops or particular geographic areas where phosphorus is used more than others? Definitely, um, they definitely vary. So some soils are naturally high in phosphorus. And so you can rely a little bit more on the plant to mine that phosphorus from the soil um, than, than you do in terms of supplementing with inorganic uh, fertilizer. Um, Typically, though, in, our, in the U.S. and our agronomic uh, soils across the Midwest, um, almost I would say every farm is going to be applying phosphorus at some point over a couple of year time period. Um, some folks are, are more fortunate than others. And in the U.S., because we have a, a, a farming system where uh, it's typically long term leases or, or land ownership, um, you can actually bank phosphorus in the soil. Now, that somewhat contributes to the environmental issue we're talking about today but the farmer isn't wasting it as in other countries where it's a one year lease. Nobody wants to leave phosphorus around for the next guy. Mm. Oh. Gotcha, gotcha. So I wanna to get to solutions, but, I, but, but uh, some of what you were saying made me think about some other, I know customers of Phospholutions and, but just more broadly others that apply uh, phosphorus fertilizer. And I'm thinking of uh, golf courses. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, also just, you know, uh, you know the residential market, not that that's the market for your product, and which, which we'll get to talk about that in a moment, but uh, what's, what's the level of phosphorus, I guess, pollution or runoff that's coming from non-agricultural lands? Quite a bit. So phosphorus, like I mentioned, uh, it enters the food ag value chain from the mine onto the farm fields as fertilizer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Imagine that fertilizer is taken up by the crop. There's a certain portion of that crop that we're ultimately going to, you know, put into the food chain. Some of that grain is going to be fed to animals uh, to produce meat, and that animal uh, is going to secrete waste, and that waste is going to include a lot of phosphorus. And, and, and one of the problems in, in high density animal ag is the manure issue, where there's such a high concentration of phosphorus. You can imagine we grow our crops in the Midwest, we ship all those grains to say the Eastern Shore to grow poultry and, and other things like that. And, and you get this high density of nutrients traveling from the, the fields that we applied phosphorus 
to the eastern shore and there's no arrow going back the other direction. It's not economical to take this manure and go put it back into the Midwest. And so what we see is this high density of nutrients being discharged off of these high density agricultural systems and it leads to regulatory pressure. It leads to um, restrictions. So a great example would be on the eastern shore, uh, poultry litter. Um, there are uh, over 100,000 acres of farmland that no longer can, can have poultry litter applied because the ratio of phosphorus to other nutrients isn't, isn't adequate. So it leads to a higher percentage of phosphorus being applied than what's preferred. Mm. Once it gets out of the animal, right, then we have, uh, then we eat grains, we eat meat, and both are high and rich in phosphorus. And our digestive systems are inefficient. And so we also discharge and secrete waste into uh, our wastewater treatment systems which have some restrictions and limits on how much we can discharge. Um, but there's sometimes mistakes. There's sometimes there's a small amount still allowed to be discharged. And that ultimately ends up directly into our waterways. Mm. You can also imagine food waste, right? Food waste being such mm. a huge issue in the U S specifically, that is literally nutrients just being landfilled. Mm. Um, and, and that also contributes to the problem. So it's, it's very multifaceted. There's a lot of industries as well that use phosphorus in certain um, certain aspects, I mean, um, you can think about uh, sugarcane production, there's a lot of, or pharmaceuticals, there's a lot of phosphoric mm. acid and other things involved in that process. And ultimately, there's an effluent issue involved. Mm. So we've got a lot of phosphorus, it's mined, it's non-renewable, uh, and most of it is ending up uh, in our waterways through these various pathways. So let's talk a little bit about solutions and then get to maybe phospholutions in particular, some of your products. So broadly speaking, though, what what are the solutions to this phosphorus pollution problem? Yeah, well, I think, I think number one, um, the most logical is making sure that we reduce our dependency on those finite reserves by trying to increase the efficiency of our biggest use, and that is fertilizer use. Mm -hmm. And so for us, we strongly believe at Phospholutions that, that the very first step is making sure that every ounce of phosphorus that's pulled out of that mine gets taken up by a plant and not ending up in the waterway. Mm -hmm. To do that, there's multiple different solutions. Uh, farmers are getting smarter every day. Technologies are being developed every day and making it to the market. And essentially, um, a whole long suite of things from, from trying to be more precise in the way we put that fertilizer on the field and only put it where we need it, when we need it. So um, going back to some nutrient stewardship 101 principles, thinking about mess management practices, trying to keep the soil on the farm, keep the soil healthy, keep the crops covered or the soil covered, things like that 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 ultimately promote less erosion, less leaching, uh, better use. Um, but that's from a fertilizer perspective. And it's great that we're trying to optimize that. And we'll speak a little bit more about our solution in, in a minute. Um, but the other side is there's still a lot, even once it's taken up by the crop, being wasted. And I think the other half of the, the solution here is to make sure that we create more of a circular economy for phosphorus, making sure that it's a more circular life cycle rather than so linear. Because when it does hit that body of water, it becomes the most expensive to remove and mine because now all of a sudden it's in a highly diluted state. It's mm. causing the issue. It's right where it needs to be to cause the issue. And then eventually it's going to make its way down to the bottom of the ocean. I don't think we figured out necessarily how to mine phosphorus out of there yet. Mm. Um, so so the, 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 the big issue or the big solution would be to also create some type of upcycled version where we are pulling phosphorus from the animal, high density animal applications, pulling phosphorus out of uh, food waste, out of human waste, out of industrial waste, and ultimately send it back into the farm fields uh, as a high efficiency fertilizer. And that's a pretty complicated uh, solution. I'm fascinated by circular economy being applied to phosphorus, and it makes me wish I would have paid attention more in chemistry class. But, you know, my, my, when I think about circular economy, I think about some of the more durable products that I am aware of, either in the electronics industry uh, in the flooring industry, and I can I have an e easier time picturing. And some of these facilities I've actually been to, and I've seen the process that they use to, you know, to take back a material and to remanufacture it, to repurpose it, and, and then send it back out. How how do you even can you can you give maybe an example of how that is done with uh, with a mineral like phosphorus? Sure. So so phosphorus can be really. Um and this is very generally speaking, uh, without getting too scientific, essentially it's really found in two different ways. It's either in a dissolved form, so it's in water, um, and it's, it, it's, it's present in its um, ionic form, it's very heavily charged and it's reactive, right? Uh, the other half is that it's tied up somehow, typically in some organic material or form. Mm -hmm. um, so 
when you think about removing it, there's a, a physical component to removing phosphorus and upcycling it when you think about the organic or the solids. Um, when you think about dissolved phosphate, it becomes a little bit more complicated because now you're talking about having to actually remove that phosphate from the water uh, and you can't do it in some physical format necessarily and then getting it back into a format that can be shipped and delivered to the farm field and applied in a plant available form. Hmm. Um, so maybe to, maybe to plug in and speak a little bit, Eric, about, about our solution in this front. Um, Perfect, yeah. So, so our whole technology is, is essentially around the use of a mineral-based adsorbent. So it's a technology that was developed at Penn State. We, we licensed two patents from the university and we have two pending, all around the use of this mineral-based adsorbent to bind and release phosphate. So from a capture and recycling side, it truly is a great material to pull phosphorus primarily from the dissolved state, which is very difficult to do economically because it's typically in way lower concentrations than the solid versions mm -hmm. of phosphorus, mm -hmm. um, as well as you need some chemi-absorptive effect to get it out of the water uh, and not carry all that water with it to the farm mm -hmm. field. Mm -hmm. So for our technology, it's the use of this adsorbent, and I say ad because it's uh, actually truly adsorbing chemically phosphate to this material. Uh, essentially, we use it as a great filter media so we can run polluted water through the product, uh, remove the phosphate, bind it to the material, and then we simply pull it out, dry it, and we can recycle it and blend it with fertilizer. Mm. Um, and we can do that through a, a few different one of those, um, I mentioned pollution sources, so areas where it's being discharged. Uh, if phosphate's in water, there's a very high likelihood we can remove it. Um, and, and, and bring it back to the farm field. But the other half of our solution and where we're much more active today commercially, Eric, is uh, in, in selling that same adsorbent as a soil amendment or fertilizer additive. So mm. essentially this stuff blends really nicely with phosphate fertilizer. Um, it's very safe to be used in the fields and it actually has the ability to bind and release phosphorus in the soil over time. And what's really unique about the process is that rather than say some of our current technologies for releasing phosphorus where we take a coating and you can imagine Eric, if you're out uh, fertilizing your lawn, you're spreading those little beads uh, mm -hmm. on your lawn. Essentially that's just a nutrient coated with the polymer. And that polymer is essentially time to release uh, based on temperature and moisture. Mm -hmm. And that's going to happen whether you uh, have a plant there soaking up those nutrients or not in the soil. So it's, it's more efficient in terms of it slows down the release. It's not very efficient because it doesn't align with plant demands. And where we've really uh, separated our technology is that instead of coating something, we have this you know, porous material that truly binds phosphorus to it and stores phosphate onto this complex until the plant essentially removes it from the product. Mm -hmm. And without getting very technical, essentially it's just driven by a chemical gradient. So every time the plant removes a unit from the soil, the product releases a unit back into solution for the plant to pull from. Uh, so it's this very controlled release. Uh, we like to call it buffered release. And essentially that's, that's, it's aligning directly with plant uptake. So we get a much higher percentage getting into the plants of fertilizer applied per acre than we do with competitive technologies. We also get a massive reduction in loss uh, to the environment because we're essentially just holding it there until the plant takes it up. So let's talk about the, the sort of the business case and environmental case for the product. And, and, and before you were talking about the reality for the farmer, for the farm operation, right? Small margins, fewer and fewer farms over the last right, many decades. Um, and yet they're, you know, certainly feeding, uh, you know, the world as is a point of pride for the United States um, is, is often said. So what's in it for them? I mean, wh why would they use your, uh, your product? What sort of, you know, we try to teach our students here to make the business case, right, for, for an environmentally or socially preferred product or service. What is it for Phospholutions? So it all comes down to, Eric, that although we have a mission where the heart in it is purely environmentally driven, there has to be a business case, like you said. And for mm -hmm. us, that business case is that we are ultimately trying to save the farmer money on fertilizer because when 60 to 90% of it's being wasted, there's mm -hmm. a huge opportunity to cut costs, input costs for a farmer to produce that acre of corn or soybean. So we've been commercially focused in, in, in a few higher value markets for us, um, our customers in the golf course industry, turf grass, greenhouses, et cetera, mm -hmm. are buying product more because of the plant health and plant growth benefits that come from a very controlled release phosphorus 
but that's not necessarily deriving a direct cost savings benefit for those, those consumers. When we get into farming, it's either you got to increase my yield or you got to cut my cost to do so. Mm -hmm. um, we've taken that approach where we want to basically be able to apply far less phosphorus per acre, optimize uptake and ultimately reduce cost. And we had some pretty compelling research. We've actually worked at, at, at Penn State with some folks there uh, doing some research, a few other um, uh, universities as well as contract research organizations showing that we've actually been able to apply up to 75% less phosphorus per acre without compromising wow. yields. And that's because so much of it is not actually used by the plant mm. that we over apply to make sure it has enough. Mm. Um, and so by integrating Rhizosorb technology, we've, we've been able to show actually up to a 40% cost savings on phosphorus inputs alone mm. when you assume that, that equivalent yield. Um, there has been many instances in the field where we've actually shown increases in, in yield with higher rates of rhizosorb getting up as high as 22% in soybean and corn. Mm. So again, the farmer, uh, when you, kind of looping this back to the idea of what solutions are out there today, mm -hmm. the solutions out there today typically to, to solve the environmental issue require the farmer to take on added cost. Our whole approach is to make sure that we provide an environmental solution secondarily to what ultimately is a good business decision for a farmer. Yeah. Uh, that value proposition is important for adoption. And, and we think that's been a missing key so far in the phosphorus equation to date. Absolutely, yeah. I often like to say that a, a, uh, a really good sustainability solution could, should be indistinguishable from a really good business solution. I absolutely wholeheartedly agree. And I think, you know, the future of phosphorus solutions does include um, I would say more regulatory influence in this regard. You know, I think climate and, and, and obviously carbon is a huge topic right now. I think phosphorus has a lot of potential to follow suit on that, on that model. So for example, nutrient trading credits, thinking mm -hmm. about trading nutrients, you know, the polluters are paying for the, the, the people putting in extra effort and money and resources towards preventing the problem. They should be exchanging in that regard. There should be an economy for these types of, of exchanges. Um, we do think that regulatory pressure will increase as we've seen it quite a bit going back to what you mentioned too in the in the homeowner or, or um, you know non-professional uh, fertilizer use categories we see you know 13 u.s states that have banned phosphorus or regulated phosphorus heavily uh, for say your homeowner to, to utilize mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of restrictions going on that are getting more and more strict in, in especially areas like the chesapeake where these states are being required to cut their their um essentially their pollution emissions uh, by quite a bit. Uh, specifically, phosphorus tends to be the really, really challenging one in this case. Um, so, you know, I think that the future, although we are trying to make it a, a pretty straightforward business case, there are other things that will come into play, I think, in the near term, similar to, to, to climate change that will start to impact how, say, even a farmer makes decisions. So have you, in, in the same way, you've sort of measured the, the business case, the 40% saving, cost savings potential, you know, um, and, and even in, in certain cases, increases in yield, the business case seems really strong. What, what about the uh, quote unquote kind of environmental case uh, at, the, at the farm? Um, is that a measured benefit that, you can, that you've been able to calculate in terms of whatever the, the measurement might be, uh, reduced runoff, I assume, reduced uh, loss of phosphorus into uh, the soil, waterways, et cetera? Yeah, so, so when you think about, again, back to those three core pieces of the problem, when you think about the finite resource aspect, right? If we can incorporate our adsorbents into the production mm. process for these phosphates, and let's just assume conservatively cut back phosphorus use in half on the farm field, right? By increasing efficiency so much, we can get away with half the amount. Mm. We're actually putting half the amount of phosphorus into the system, ultimately mm. into the environment every single year. When you're talking about $76 billion worth of phosphate each year, you're talking, you know, millions and millions and millions of tons. That is a substantial impact uh, alone, but it would take a while for that impact to be seen uh, at the, at the, the end case level, right? At the, at the ocean level. The other part of it is, is that not only are we are applying four times less, but we have data showing that we can reduce leaching by up to 88%. Uh, so, so the amount that's actually lost from the farm field. Right. Um, so, so that's a pretty impact, pretty big impact just from the fertilizer standpoint. Uh, but again, as you get further downstream and you start to think about solutions where you're upcycling phosphorus, that further reduces your dependency, further reduces uh, the need for what we call virgin phosphate. Mm. Um, 
And then lastly, something that we're really interested in exploring more is kind of full life cycle analysis, thinking about the, the, the impact on carbon emissions, something we haven't captured to date, but looks pretty, pretty alarming when we start to think about how much is actually being polluted through, through phosphorus uh, ending up in the waterways. And we think that thinking about cutting back on the contribution there could be substantial in terms of trying to, to meet some of these other environmental issues uh, and th those goals. Nice. So I want to, uh, in a minute, ask you how people can learn more about phospholutions, but I want to circle back uh, back to how we started, back to sort of Piney Point in Florida. This is the thing that, you know, it's, it's been in the news, grabbed people's attention. I'm wondering if this is an instant as you're talking of, of, of um, similar to straws. So what I mean by that is that sometimes these issues come up that grab the public consciousness and it's like, let's go after straws. Um, and you could say, well, that's an issue, but of course there's, it, it actually just is an echo of a much larger issue. And I yep. wonder if that's our opportunity here with Piney Point that clearly, you know, 480 million gallons of nutrient laden water going into Tampa Bay is a significant issue. And I don't mean to uh, in any way uh, diminish the, 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 um, the severity and the urgency of dealing with that. But it also seems to me that what can often happen, I wonder if that's the straw in the sense of, it seems to me, based on what you're saying, there is a much larger issue uh, that, around phosphorus that needs to be addressed that the public um, uh, is just becoming aware of. Yeah, so, so I think, Eric, that's a great analogy. <clears throat> in terms of, you know, cutting straws out isn't necessarily going to cut the, the, the plastic pollution issue, right? Yeah. I, I do think that, so maybe I'll shed just a little light into what's going on to the Piney Point issue, and I'll relate that to how this is a, a great example of a massive, massive problem, and I can relate to how small this really is uh, mm -hmm. compared to how big the problem is. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what happened in Piney Point is essentially when you're mining phosphates, uh, it's a process that, you know, for every ton of phosphate fertilizer, you're producing five tons of what they call phosphogypsum. And that is essentially the byproduct of extracting the phosphate from the rock. And it's this uh, kind of nasty stuff. It's, it's just a, a byproduct that has to be stacked uh, essentially into these giant mounds. Um, and what happens in Florida, especially, is you get a lot of rain. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been here in the summer at five o'clock, but it rains every single day. Mm -hmm. And you get these torrential downpours and it fills up these ponds essentially on the top of the gypsum stacks. Uh, and then that water has to be managed. So in the, when, the, when the mine is actually active, they're using that water in the production process and eating away at that. And there's a net negative water use. And so we, we tend to actually uh, need that to be replenished. When you shut down the mine, now it's just a liability. Now the pond continues to fill. And, uh, and the owners of that property are essentially um, supposed to be managing that water going forward. Those gyp stacks are lined with, uh, with, with materials to try to keep them from leaking. Uh, and in this instance, essentially, there was a potential breach in that leak. Um, there was a, a, a catastrophe that could have been much, much worse. And the idea was, is let's do a controlled release <clears throat> of about that 480 million gallons of water so that we can prevent a catastrophe of this thing breaking down significantly. Um, so in that process, it was decided to, to, to discharge that water. Uh, like you mentioned, it's an alarming amount of, of nutrients that are being, uh, that are leaving the site and entering right into Tampa Bay and, and at a pretty poor time. Um, in the next coming months is when we start to get, see the algae take hold. And so this was really a, a pretty alarming piece of it. But to put that into perspective, this is one of 20 to 30 mines sitting here in Florida. This is not a, a ah. problem. This isn't the only place in the country that we mine phosphate. No. And uh, we are a pretty small piece of, uh, of the total amount of phosphate that's existing around the world. And I would, I would commend the U.S. in some regard for having uh, much more strict regulations on that discharge than, say, other countries mm. uh, doing the same exact process where they don't have to have that same uh, environmental regulation. So if you think about it, we have the byproduct of phosphate production leaking at 480 million gallons of, of, of water. Imagine the amount of phosphate that came out of the lifetime of that mine and made it itself into the total system, right? Mm -hmm. And the system approach and the amount that's the legacy phosphorus that's existed mm -hmm. from pulling that much out. To me, the Piney Point is, is a pretty small drop in the global bucket of, of phosphorus pollution. Mm -hmm. um, but we will see, we will see some impact uh, locally uh, here from it. Yeah, great, great perspective. So interesting. Well, thank you so much. So how, how do people learn more about 
about FOSS Solutions? Where can they find you online, social media, whatever you want to share with, uh, with folks and how they can learn more about you and FOSS Solutions? Sure. So you can find us at our website, www.fossvolutions.com. Uh, we also have a, another website highlighting our, our technology uh, as a fertilizer additive. That's riseabsorb.com. That's uh, riseabsorb with a Z. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. You can find me at uh, Hunter Swisher uh, on LinkedIn and uh, as well as all of our social media followings for Boss Solutions. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, uh, Hunter. My takeaways from the, at least the, sol the, the solution that you guys offer is pretty compelling, right? Reduce my cost by 40%, reduce leaching by 80%. Strong business case, strong environmental case. If you were a student, this would be an A plus. <laughs> and Eric, we're having a lot of fun doing it. So <laughs> that's great. So thank you for being here. Really appreciate it, Hunter. Thank, thanks for the opportunity, Eric, and uh, and the platform here to speak about a problem that uh, unfortunately doesn't usually get as much national coverage and, and press, but certainly is uh, something that is 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 threatening humanity worldwide. So thank you for for taking the opportunity to to speak a little bit about it. My pleasure. Thank you so much.